Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good. What's pending? <laughs> Free. <laughs> hey, if you have your Bibles this morning, I encourage you to turn with me to uh, Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. While you're finding your place there, let me just say it's a privilege for me as pastor here to serve alongside some creative, creative folks. <laughs> I'm blessed. I really am. And I hope you are blessed as well. Because we, we have people giving up their time, their talents, their treasure to serve God, to create an environment where we can come into God's presence and, and focus on Him. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. I pray we never take that for granted. That we never take this opportunity for granted. That we never get to the place where it's all just Sunday. Because you know, we're coming up on Easter. And we can all get excited about that. But let me remind you of something. Every Sunday is Easter. Amen. Every Sunday, God is alive. Amen. God is risen. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is victorious. He is greater. Every Sunday is the Lord's day. And it's something that should pump us up and get us excited. Where we say, God, I'm coming. I'm ready. I don't have to go to church. I get to. I get to be here. I get to be in your presence. I get to open my mouth and worship you. I get to look at your word so you can speak to my heart. Oh, I'm preaching already. God is good. God is good. And that's what we need. I need that. I crave that. And I pray that you do too. And so this morning as we're finishing up our greater series, how many of you have been encouraged by this? I've heard so many reports and responses from folks that saying, Pastor Mike, you're preaching and I feel like God's speaking to me. And I just want to encourage you. He is. Right. It's because He loves you. It's because He knows where you are. And it's because you're listening. And I want to encourage you to keep that open heart, that, that attitude that says, God, I'm going to continue to seek you. I don't have this all figured out, but I'm going to continue to press in because I need you. God honors that. And he will speak to you. I promise you that this morning. And so as we finish up this series, I want to finish up with just one thought. And it's kind of a summary of everything we've talked about so far. And it's this. God is greater than our circumstances. He really is. Am I preaching to a church that believes that this morning? That, that God's greater than your circumstances. Let, let me just say this, because I think we need to up front. I love life. I enjoy life. I, I, I'm looking forward to that day where I can be in heaven, but I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want to be there yet. I enjoy life. I, I enjoy going new places, meeting new people, learning new things. I enjoy spending time with my family. I enjoy life. And it's something that God wants us to enjoy, not something that we should dread. But at the same time, I understand life is complicated. Life doesn't always go the way that you want it to go. Things don't always happen the way we want them to. Life is tough and life is challenging. And in the words of my 12th grade sociology teacher, he kind of summed it up in a great way. He said, life is unfair. It really is in a lot of ways. And Jesus talks about this. This is what I love about the Bible, that, that it's relevant for today. It's relevant for where you are today. It's not some outdated book. It's something that applies to our life. Because in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus gives us these words, and he says this. In this world, you will have trouble. Not you might be able to escape it. Not if you have enough resources, you can get by it. Not if you're smart enough and you have the right connections, you can outsmart it. You will, and I will, have trouble. Jesus says that. And so understand what that means. Problems are part of life. I don't like them, and you don't like them. But as long as we have breath in the side of us, problems are part of life. And so what that means is that in our lifetime, we're going to experience some things. We're going to experience some setbacks. You ever been there? We're, we're, going, to, we're going to have struggles. You ever struggled with things before? That's life. You ever face battles? Because in this lifetime, we will face battles. 
You, you ever encountered problems before? I know I have. Because Jesus said problems are part of life. And as I began to think about this, I think you would agree with me that problems come in all different shapes and sizes. Don't they? And, and I began to think about this and, and how poor choices can produce problems. Did you know the Bible says that you reap what you sow? And so what that means is that every decision we make, every choice we make, it's like seed that we're planting in, in the ground. And Jesus says that that seed will come and it will be fruitful and you'll get a harvest. And so if we make good choices and we honor God and do what we can to live a righteous life, God honors that and we can reap the rewards of that. But if we make poor choices and poor decisions, we will reap those things. And a lot of people are facing problems in their life today because of poor choices. Because of things that look to be so small that they could just overlook that now have become a problem. Problems are part of life, right? How many of you know that people can produce problems? Scripture says bad company corrupts good character. The people we allow to speak into our life, the people that we associate ourselves with, they can build us up spiritually or they can bring us down. And a lot of people are where they are in life because of the people they choose to hang out with. And now they're struggling and they've got all these circumstances coming against them and it's because of the wrong people. Right? How many of you know pain can produce problems? We kind of already touched on it, but I don't know about you, life can be stressful. It really can. Uh, life can be inconvenient at times. Life can be uncomfortable at times. Life can be full of pain. And we've got sickness, we've got disease, we've got death, we've got tragedies. We have wickedness and evil in this world. We have wars and earthquakes and all this stuff happening and it causes problems right and then lastly we know that the the prince of darkness can produce problems that's the enemy that's satan that he wants to steal kill and destroy and he can cause problems but I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful for his word. Because even though he says in this world you will have trouble, he didn't stop there. I mean, if he would have stopped there, I would have got out my hanky and I would start crying. <laughs> and, and I'd be like, what's the point of all this? I mean, if you're going to have trouble in this world, I mean, that's not very comforting. That's not very encouraging. Come on, Jesus. And so Jesus says three words that I hope will change your life, that I hope will change the way that you're looking even at your circumstances right now. You ready for these three words? But take heart. That's what he said. You'll have trouble, but take heart. You know what that means? That even in the middle of your circumstances, you can have courage. Even in the middle of your circumstances, you can be hopeful. In the middle of your circumstances, you can be bold. You know why? Because Jesus is greater than your problems. Jesus is greater than your circumstances. Can anybody thank him for that this morning? He is greater. He is greater. And so I don't pretend to be up here this morning knowing what your circumstances are. I, I, I don't. But I would like to ask you a question. How many of you would say, Pastor Mike, I need a now God moment. I need God to show up and show out. I need God right now to move in my circumstances and to move in my life. How many of us need a now God moment? I pray all of our hands are up. Because we always need God to move. We always need God to, to come into our life and our situation and begin to move and orchestrate things. Because let's face it, we're not that good. But He is. Amen. And He's great. 
And so we need a now God moment. So I'm just going to give you one thought this morning. What leads to that? If we need a now God moment, what leads to that? And we're going to see this in Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read it here in a second. Let me give you some background just, just in case uh, you're, you're, you're trying to track with me this morning. At 605 B.C., there was a king named Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of the Babylonian Empire, the most powerful empire in all the world. And what he would do is he would go into countries, he would take their best and brightest individuals, he would take noblemen and the sons of princes and people from the royal court, people that had potential, and he would take them captive and bring them back to Babylon and indoctrinate them in the ways of his nation. That's what he would do. And so the Bible says that he invaded Judah and the capital city of Jerusalem. And in this first siege, he brings back four people that we may have heard before. If you've been in Sunday school, you've probably seen the flannel board of these guys. And their name was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so we're going to pick up their story here in Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, or Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read a few verses. But we believe in the Bible here. So we're going to let it speak today, okay? Are you ready for it? All okay. right. Verse 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. I'd have been in that group. <laughs> I've just seen if you're listening. <laughs> Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine, from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years. So this is like Babylon University here. And then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. And just in case you're wondering, these were names of their gods. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. Verse 8, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid of the Lord, uh, the king. Who, who's ordered that you eat his food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other uh, young men your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. So Daniel spoke with the attendant who'd been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, Azariah. Please test us for ten days. How we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. Is that a great story? Yeah. And I think as you read this story, we would all agree that Daniel was experiencing trouble. I don't know about you, I wouldn't like that. I, I wouldn't want to sign up for that, right? 
be taken captive from my home, taken to a foreign country, forced to serve the king. That's not an ideal situation. And these are not ideal circumstances. But here's what I want us to see. Daniel did something that led to a now God moment. You see, we can put ourselves in a position for God to move. Did you know that? Did you know that when we're in the middle of circumstances and situations, that we can do something that, that kind of opens up the door for God to come in and move and work? And Daniel did this. He, he understood the key, in a sense, to unlock what God could do. And it's in verse 8. And it's one word. This one word changed Daniel's life. And it was determination. That was it. Aren't you glad you came this morning? Just one word. That's all you have to remember. Now your translation of scripture may say this. Resolve. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. And that word resolve means simply this. To make up one's mind. Determination. See, long before trouble ever came, Hear me this morning, Daniel's way. He had already made up his mind that no matter what, he was going to follow God. He had already made up his mind that he was going to be committed to God, and no matter what, he would not compromise his faith. He had already made up his mind. He made up his mind that he was going to be committed to God. Now let me say this to you. If you wait until you have some circumstances come your way before you make up your mind, you're in trouble. And see, that's unfortunately where a lot of people are. A lot of people get this backwards. A lot of people have this attitude where, okay God, I've got some things going on in my life, but if you come in and you help me out and you make things better for me, then I'll decide later on whether I'll, I'll serve you. I'll decide later on if I'll honor you. But you just fix it first. That's backwards thinking. And that's not faith. Because faith says, even though I don't understand it, even though I don't figure it out, God, I trust you, I love you, and I'm going to follow you no matter what. God honors that. And that puts you in a position for God to move in your circumstances and to move in your life. One word, resolved. Are you resolved? You know, I've, I've had to, the privilege to meet some folks lately who are resolved. A couple weeks ago I met with someone in just talking in my office, we were just talking about life, really. Just, just talking about some things. And, and in the middle of the conversation, just began to talk about some difficulties, some issues, some struggles, some, some things that weren't ideal, not ideal circumstances. And we're just kind of talking about it and sharing things back and forth. And it just encouraged me, it blessed me. Because this individual was saying, I, I know God can turn it around. I, I know God can work. I know God can move. I, I know that He can do more than, than I can imagine or think. I have faith. But then this person said something that as a pastor I love to hear. And they said this, even if it doesn't work out the way I want it to, I'm going to follow God. Amen. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to keep walking with God regardless. You know what that is? That's a made up mind. That's resolve. And God honors that. Lisa and I have some friends in South Carolina who were expecting their third child, all excited about it. And then one day they, they go to get a checkup, see how the baby's doing, no heartbeat. They're devastated. We could just read it on, on Facebook how they're devastated. They're crying. They, they don't understand it. They're broken. But yet at the end of this email, they say something. And, and it's basically this. We still trust God. We don't understand it. But we're going to follow God. 
We're going to trust God. We're going to honor God. Even in the middle of this circumstance, even in the middle of this pain, we're going to love God. Do you know what that is? That's a made-up mind. That's resolve. And that opens up the door for God to move in circumstances. What leads to that? Two questions. You might be saying, well, how, how can I have that kind of faith? How, how can I trust God like that? How can I believe that God's greater than my circumstances? What can I do to help make up my mind, to help be resolved? I'm going to give you two thoughts. You ready for this? And then we're going to do something a little bit unusual. I want to have some folks help me this morning kind of preach this message. Is that okay? Two thoughts. Here it is. Number one, who are you going to trust? If you're going to be resolved, if you're going to have a made up mind, you must answer this question. Who are you going to trust? Who are you going to trust? You gonna trust God? You gonna trust His Word? You gonna trust your feelings? You gonna trust people around you? You gonna trust your resources? You gonna trust in your own strength? Who are you gonna trust? Because we all trust something or someone. And a made-up mind says, no matter what, I trust God. Regardless if I can figure this out, I trust God. Regardless of this makes sense or not, I trust God. I've already made up my mind. You can't convince me. I'm going to trust God. And the second question is this. What story do you want to tell? What story do you want to tell? See, we call that legacy. And you know, a lot of people want to say... You know, mid-age is kind of like, I don't know, 60, 70, people start thinking about legacy. I'm convinced that's kind of hogwash. My parents used to say that. <laughs> because I'm 42, and you know what I'm thinking about? Legacy. What story do I want to tell? What story do I want to be able to sit down one day with my daughter and say, you know what? Yeah, I encountered some, some things in life. Life wasn't fair. It didn't always go the way I wanted it to. But God was faithful every step of the way. Amen. That's legacy. Amen. That's a story. And what story do you want to tell? What story do you want to tell? See, that helps us to be resolved. That helps us to have a made-up mind. And so I'm going to have some folks come to the stage today. They're going to help me kind of preach the rest of this message. So I've got some guys that are going to help me this morning. I'm going to ask Brian and Angie Bishop if they would come today. They're going to help me uh, preach this message. You guys ready? Hey, can you give them a hand as they come? Yeah, we, got, we got some stools for you guys. Does that mic work? All right. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. All right. Is that on? Testing one, two, there you go. <laughs> Good to see you guys this morning. Hey, we're just going to interview. Is that cool? Yeah. You might see me on 60 minutes sometimes, you know? Who knows? You know, really, really what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to give them an opportunity to kind of share some of their story, kind of share a little bit about what, what God's doing in their life and, and how they've kind of answered these questions, who, who they're going to trust and, and what story they want to share. And I'm going to give them an opportunity to share that. Before I do, let, let me just say from, from Lisa and I, uh, we've been here about a year. And uh, we know that when we first came here, you guys kind of surrounded us. You guys kind of made it clear that you were on our side, you were praying for us, and that you wanted to help in any way possible. And so Lisa and I just want to let you know that we really appreciate that. And, and we really thank you for your prayers and just for your love and support and everything else that, that you've showed us over these last couple months. So we, we appreciate that very much. And um, 
you know, we're talking about uh, transition in a little bit. We know you guys are kind of transitioning into full-time missions uh, through a ministry that's called Chi Alpha. Some of you may or may not be aware of that. And so what I wanted to do is just give you an opportunity. Tell us what Chi Alpha is for, for those of us that may not know it and where you guys are going to be going and what kind of things you're going to be doing. If you just share that with us. Well, Chi Alpha is a ministry that requires anyone to join. They have to sacrifice a gold with a banana while I pull the <laughs> See, I didn't know that. <laughs> You're learning some stuff today. No, uh, Chi Alpha is a Christian organization that was started by the Assemblies of God back in 1953. Um, and its sole purpose is to reconcile students to Christ. That we can empower them by the teachings about the Holy Spirit and who God is so that when they graduate, they can be effective witnesses, not only on the campus, but when they go into the marketplace and into the whole world. Um, one of the things that, that, uh, about Chi Alpha is that, that we teach what Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, where he says to pursue, pursue love. And we don't mean as in trying to find love. We're not there to help students find that before they do. But to pursue love as in loving others around you and love one another so that the world may see that. Because the scripture says that they will know you by the, your love for one another. And then he says after that, to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Chi Alpha believes in the moving of the Holy Spirit, that he still moves today, that the gifts are available for students and we teach them about those gifts. And when they get filled with those gifts, they are empowered to reach their campuses and transform them. And um, we also, we are U.S. missionaries um, through the Assemblies of God, and we are serving what we believe is the most strategic mission field in the world. It's not the most important mission field in the world because that's your backyard. The most important mission field in the world is to where God has called you. But we believe it's the most strategic because this is a point in time when students are making those really important life decisions about who they're going to marry and what they're going to do as their career. And most importantly, many of them for the first time, what they're going to believe. And the university is also an amazing place to reach international students. They're coming to our doorstep and we get to um, pour into them in our language of English and love them. Um, and then they get to go back to their countries if they've been touched by the power of Christ as indigenous missionaries um, to spread Christ in their own country, in their own communities, in their own language. So it's really strategic. Um, what we're doing from here on out is God has called us to plant a new Chi Alpha at Lawrence University in Appleton. And while we may not be going across the world, culturally it's like we're going to a different world. Lawrence is very, very different than UW Oshkosh. Um, it's very small, only 1,500 students, um, but it is the most expensive school in Wisconsin. Um, it, the students that go there um, have a lot of outwardly material things. They don't really have any material needs, um, I mean, other than like your typical college student, but even then, like everything is provided for. They have a lot of status, they have a lot of success. Um, a lot of times we hear students say when they come to Oshkosh, like it's the last place they wanted to be. That's not the case at Lawrence. Um, students want to go there, they, they work hard to get there. But even with all of this outward success, it's really just a facade. Sorry. Um, the students of Lawrence are really broken and really hurting. Um, they are under an immense amount of pressure. They um, really have no idea about who Jesus is or how he loves them. Really, um, at Lawrence, the, um, there's a culture of tolerance, but the only group that is not tolerated is Christians. Um, there's no room for them at all. A lot of times in world missions, we talk about how you know, there's open countries and closed countries. We are really looking at Lawrence as a closed country. Um, there is no room for Jesus there right now. Um, but we are going there to begin to make room for Jesus. We believe that God is already opening the door um, in so many ways. But we're going there to, um, the Christian students who are there struggle. It's hard to make it through Lawrence and remain a Christian, much less a thriving one. Um, so we're going there to empower those students to be strong in their faith and to reach their campus. 
And we are going there to introduce the almost 1,500 students who have no idea who Jesus is and are relying solely on themselves and the things that they learn. Um, and we're there to introduce them to Jesus and to show them how he can change their world and their lives. So let's kind of talk about this here uh, a little bit. Um, you know, we've been talking today about a made-up mind, about being resolved. And I know you guys have made up your mind. We, we've talked that, you know, you're going to follow God. and You're stepping out in faith into this full-time missions work. But I also know you guys have gone through some challenging situations, that some things in your life have not been ideal. Um, would, would you mind kind of showing us or telling us how, how you've learned to trust God through those things? And how's God shown you that, that he's greater than your circumstances? Sure. Well, we have been here in Oshkosh um, almost seven years to the day I was thinking about it. And the first time we came to New Life was the first Sunday in April, seven years ago. Um, so that was pretty fun. But I was thinking about who we were and what our life was like seven years ago. And our daughter, Ellie, was about um, eight months old. Um, our son, Jaron, was still a bun in the oven. And um, just thinking about, um, you know, I appreciate what you said, Pastor Mike, about how life is really good. And we've had a lot of great things over the past seven years, but we've also had a lot of challenges. Um, our daughter was extremely ill um, and really almost died. She was at Children's in Madison for a week. Um, that was very stressful. Um, during those seven years, I um, was diagnosed with a chronic illness that I've struggled with through various times um, throughout those seven years. Um, we have had financial difficulties. We have had the you know, it's, it's always been our heart to be in full-time ministry together. And, you know, this is the first time in 11 years that we're getting to step out in that. But during that time, the frustration of, is this ever going to happen? God, we know you've called us to this. Like, when is it going to happen? When is, in years and years and years. So all of those challenges really um, are things that we've faced. But I just, I remember so clearly, um, in really one of the darkest times in my life, um, as I was struggling with being sick and what that meant and um, all of these things, God spoke to me so clearly and he said, um, I haven't left you. And I know that there's these circumstances that are happening outside of you, but my promises haven't changed. And my calling to you and my gifts that I've given you, those are irrevocable. And I'm still with you and those things that I know you've been dreaming about doing, you're still gonna do them because I still have them for you. And that was probably, I don't know, four or five years ago. And here we are today getting ready to step over that threshold. Um, yeah. it's, I mean, it's really, it's awesome. And I just really, as I was um, thinking about this and preparing for today, I just really felt um, compelled to, sh that we wanted to share with you our testimony. You know, the Bible says that we'll overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we have um, walked alongside of so many of you these past seven years and seen the challenges and the circumstances and the struggles that you have faced. And they're different than ours, and ours aren't any greater or any worse than anybody else's. Um, but just to encourage you that um, the same things that God has spoken over us, he's speaking over you right now. His promises aren't unique just to us. They are for each of you. Um, and so to have confidence and courage like you're talking about, Pastor Mike, just to step out in faith and to trust him because he won't forsake you. Um, so that's sort of a synopsis of the past seven years. The past six months um, have been quite a roller coaster and a lot of things have intensified. So Brian's going to share a little bit about that. So it was back in about October. Resolve. Resolve, yes. I was sitting at our kitchen table after five years of working at Emo Harris Bank and not being able to support raise because I was working 40 hours a week, a very trying time. And I was sitting at the table and I just said to my wife, let's just trust God and I'm going to quit the bank in January, no matter where we're at financially. We're just going to believe God's going to bring in the income. Like, okay. So we trusted God. A couple weeks later, after that, Pastor Steve Nichols up in Kimberly called me and said, hey, I'd like to have lunch with you. So we sat down, we had lunch, and he, and he started sharing his heart with us about Warren University 
and we we also share that passion. We had desired to launch a, a, a Chi Alpha there, but just some things fell through, and so it, uh, it just got put on the wayside. But as we discussed it, he asked me, what would it take for you to be able to get moving towards launching this new Chi Alpha? So I gave him, a, I said, I need this dollar amount. I can't quit my bank unless I have this coming in. So we said, all right, well, let me talk to our board, see what we can do. And then we went and shared a message with them, and the church picked us up for that dollar amount that I said we can step out in faith on that. Yeah. So just a couple of things God does after us, okay? But when you, now listen, when you are walking with God, you know you're walking with God when things go wrong because the enemy doesn't want you to be successful. So a couple of weeks later, most of the electricity in our house goes out. Like a week after. A week after I quit the bank. I've got no income. And I have an electrician looking for a couple of days. And he's like, I can't, there's a short in your house, I can't find it, it's old knob tubing, it probably buried the conjunction box in the wall, I can't find it. So he, I said, what do we have to do? He says, we have to replace all of your wiring. Awesome, what's that gonna cost? $2,800. Praise God. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I posted a thing on Facebook, and, and here's the awesome thing. It, 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 so many of you, you know, a Sunday morning we get here, it had taken a love offering for us, and, and we're just pulling these dollar bills out of this box. And, and you guys had raised for us $2,100 total. So help us. But it, gets, it gets better, okay? <laughs> so I had the electrician come, and we, well, I'm in Chicago, I'm doing a support raising training, and as I'm driving back, I pray to the Lord. I say, Lord, what would be really great is you help us find this short in our house so that we don't have to spend that whole $2,800 to have our house rewired and everything. So Friday morning, the electrician shows up, and we start working on some wiring, and all of a sudden I say, do you smell that? He says, what? I smell smoke. No, I don't smell that. So he goes upstairs, and I look in my living room, and there's smoke coming out of my ceiling fan. Tom, there's smoke! <laughs> so, she's, so he kept in there's coming out of the luxury socks and everything. So we call the fire department. They come in, they hack down our walls, our ceilings, and everything. Okay? And we have to put out this fire. And so <laughs> after it's all said that I said to Tom, I asked the Lord to show us where the short was. <laughs> I should have been more specific. <laughs> but we found the short. So I so you know, so I, I call our insurance company. I'm like, well, our insurance would cover this now. So I call our insurance company, and I'm talking, and they're going to get us in a hotel and everything like that. And, uh, you know, I ask, what's our deductible? $500. Great. So we're dropping down our costs and, and, and things that we're going to have to do. And then the ins because the electrician was there, his supervisor had to come look at the damage and stuff, taking pictures. I said to him, I do not hold Tom responsible. There was a short that just left these exposed wires in our wall. Someone just left these exposed wires in there. And he says, okay, after starting to get things set up, they call me about an hour later. This gentleman calls me back. His name is Riley. And he says, I know that you don't want us responsible. But he said, but our guy was there. And he's working on electrical, and there's an electrical fire. We're going to cover everything. <laughs> so, every electrical wire, we've done the new brand new couch, new furniture, everything, and we don't have to pay a dollar. <laughs> That's God's faithfulness to his people when they resolve that we're going to trust God no matter what. That, that, that my God is not Demo Harris Bank. He, they are not my paycheck. They are not the ones that feed my family, put a house over our heads. It's the trust in God and our resolve to follow him. Amen. That's awesome. And so we, you know, we believe here that. God's maybe laying on some folks' heart, you know, they, they want to pick you up financially, maybe help you financially. Um, can you just tell them, what, what do they need to know? What do they need to do? do? What, what's kind of the, the process there? How can they Absolutely. help you if that's where God's leading them? And, and, and before I share that, just really quick, too, I want to say one more thing about Lawrence to, to kind of just really get you guys to understand the severity of the problem there with these students. You, you think about that they're, this, they're living in this high society and, and and they're the top ten in their class, but when at our school they are the, they are two thirds higher than the national average when it comes to depression and suicide rate. 
in a recent year, out of 1,500 students, six attempted suicide. That'd be like 60 at Oshkosh in a year. They are hurting, and we need to reach them with the gospel. Their hope and their reliance is that they believe that they will find value in achievement and getting all these majors. That is not where our value comes from. Our value comes from having a relationship with Christ and the plans and directions for our lives that He has. That's where true joy comes from. And that's why we need to be there. Now, as far as support, Angie and I, like Angie said, we are U.S. missionaries with the Assemblies of God. And we are missionaries to the third largest unreached nation in the world. Did you guys know that? Only China and India have more unsaved people than America does. So as such, because we are U.S. missionaries, we are required by the Young Assemblies of God to raise a monthly budget so that we can do this ministry full time. So what we do is we, we have churches and people partner with us financially. They make a, a commitment to partner with us on a monthly basis by filling out a faith promise form. And then you would pay that for, and we're just asking right now, we're just asking people to make a three-year commitment to say, yes, we will help you launch this ministry and get that going for three years. And people can do either, you know, we'll do anywhere from 25 to 50 and maybe even some big kind of hitters, $100 a month to help us go. Because listen, we have to raise, by the end of July, we need to raise an additional $1,500 a month. We've got a big number to hit. And I'm really praying and hoping that our home church, our friends, that you guys will believe in us and believe in the call that God has put on our hearts to help us notch that down a little bit. <laughs> So you guys have a table? We have a table outside. Yeah. Please, at the end of the service, please come out. We've printed a ton of paper practice forms. And we have a sign-up sheet. And here's the thing, because I'm not we're not talking a lot about Lawrence this morning. I would love the chance to sit down with each and every one of you. So if you could write down your name, your phone number, and your email address, so that I can call you and schedule time to take you out for coffee and share with you about Lawrence University and the call that God has put on our life there. And if you sign on that email, on the email, we will add you to our newsletter list. We send out a monthly newsletter to keep you informed on what God is doing, on our status as far as how far we are in our support raising, and, and just the move of God that's happening. Awesome. You going to take them out to Starbucks? <laughs> Starbucks Blues Brew. Yeah. Blues Brew. <laughs> okay. No, we'll just go. We'll just go to Quick Trip and we'll just sit. <laughs> Hey, that would work too. <laughs> no problem. That would work too. Well, some of you may or may not be aware of this, but this is actually Brian and Angie's last Sunday with us today. Um, wanted to kind of give them an opportunity to share and kind of let you know what their heart is. God's speaking to you about maybe picking them up monthly. Please stop by their table. But, you know, I, I just wanted to say, first of all, or, or lastly, however you want to say it, that, you know, I appreciate your faithfulness, that, that you guys have been here and you've been planted here, and, and you've served and you've been faithful, and uh, you know just everything that you and your family has done, we, Lisa and I have, have greatly appreciated that. I know that our, our church body here has appreciated that. So you know we're, we're going to miss you. This, this is kind of bittersweet. We know you're still kind of be in the area. We'll, we'll see you from time to time, but it's, it's transition. And, um, we're excited about helping to partner with you and, and send you guys off. But, um, you know, you've also meant so much to us here that, um, you know, we're, we're going to miss you guys. And we really appreciate that. So can you just tell us that as a church, transition, a lot of things happening, how can we pray for you specifically? Thank you. The first a huge one that we were really asking people to pray about is that we need five students. Lawrence is a private campus, and as such, we have absolutely no rights there whatsoever. We cannot get on that campus if we don't find five students who want to not to partner with us as Kyoko, but are passionate about reaching that campus. So please pray that as I'm itinerating, trying to raise this budget, that we're also meeting students and, and getting a chance to, to build relationships with them so that we can get that core five. So we need five students. We also um, appreciate prayers for our relationship with the administration at Lawrence. 
Um, and alongside with those five students, like Brian can't really walk into the Dean of Students, who's a very um, liberal woman, and say, hey, I'm a white, almost 40-year-old male, and let me start talking about Jesus out of your school. This won't fly. Um, so um, we just need favor with the administration, that they would be willing um, to at least let us say what we need to say, to at least let us have a presence with students on the campus. And really, um, you know, Brian talked about that we pursue love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. We pray that we would be seen as the group that loves. That when they think about Chi Alpha at Lawrence, the first thought wouldn't be, oh, it's those crazy Jesus people who um, are shutting everybody down. But know that, oh, they're the group that loves our students. They're the group that takes care of our students. Even though we may not agree with them, we know that they take care of us and they love us. So please pray for open, open doors, open hearts, and that we would be faithful representatives of Christ's love at Lawrence. And then the other thing is just pray for us because there's hard soil, that we, hard ground that we have to start digging through to even start to make an impact on that campus. So godly wisdom, we need the Holy Spirit to be manifest in us so that we know how to best proceed on reaching this campus. So. And then also please pray for our family as we transition out of here um, into a new church. Um, please pray for our children, that they make new friends and that they transition well. And um, eventually, hopefully sooner than later, we hope to move our whole house, our whole family to Appleton. So please pray um, for the right house to come forward for us. Pray that our house here in Oshkosh would sell quickly, that would allow us to move um, up there and, and just that our transition would be smooth. And I really have no doubt about this because God has taken such good care of us over the last seven years, but it never hurts to ask. <laughs> that he'll just continue, just continue to take care of us and that he'll provide friendships for all five of us, for us and our children and for grandma, that as we all go up there together, um, that he'll provide that support system that we need as a family. And then just the last one, and, and also if you sign up for a newsletter, you will see these prayer requests on there, okay? So please sign up so that you can know how to pray for us on a monthly basis. But the final one is, again, the support, the financial support that we need to raise. Pray for favor from God that churches will return my calls and schedule services, allow me to share, and also just friends that, that, they, would, that they would share in with the passion that we have and the vision that we have and partner with us so that we can get on campus. That's... That's the huge task that I have right now. Dialing every day, calling. Please let me come and share with you. So, awesome. Well, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. We, we appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. We are proud of you. Thank you, Tim. If you come to help us this morning, hopefully you've been encouraged this morning. Hopefully you've been been reminded that we serve a God who's greater in our circumstances and, and what he can do for, for Brian and for Angie, he can do for you and he wants to do. But it starts with a made up mind, a, a heart that says, God, I, I'm, I'm trusting you no matter what. God honors that. God honors that. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? We're going to pray and then we're, we are going to receive a love offering, an outreach offering. Every, every fifth Sunday, we're, we're going to do that. Because we believe in investing in people. And, and so today, I, I feel like there's no better thing we can do as a church than to receive an outreach offering, offering and invest in Brian and Angie and in their ministry and what they're going to be doing there in the campus of Lord. So I just want to give you an opportunity now to, to kind of think about that, prepare for that in the moment. Our ushers are getting ready. But let's just pray. Let, let's just allow the Lord's presence to just minister to us for a moment. Can we do that? Not, not be in a rush today. Father God, we just thank you today for speaking to our hearts and our lives. God, I just thank you so much that you are a faithful God. And Lord, no matter what we go through in life, no matter what our challenges are, we know that you're greater. We know that you're wiser. We, we know that you're stronger. God, we know that you're always with us. And so, God, we thank you for that this morning. And, God, even those today that may be in trying times, that may say, Lord, I'm, I'm in problems right now. I've got some difficult circumstances. God, I pray that even now they would make up their mind 
that they are going to trust you, that they are going to put their hope in you, that they're going to put their faith in you. And God, as they do that, I pray that you would just move in mighty ways in their life, in their situations. God, your word says that you're able to do more than we can ask, imagine, or think. But God, we come to you today asking. We need you to move. We need a now God moment. Lord, there are families that need you to move. There are marriages, God, that need you to move. God, there, there are relationships that need to be restored. There are hopes and dreams that have died that, God, you want to resurrect and bring to life again. God, we need you. And I pray that as we resolve to, to follow you no matter what, as we make up our mind, even as a church, we make up our mind, God, we're not going back. We're, we're not going back to the way things used to be. We're not going back to that old way of thinking, to that old way of doing things. God, you're calling us into something new, something great. And God, we are going to move forward trusting you. We're resolved. We thank you for that in Jesus, Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, would you come this morning? As God lays it on your heart to give, I pray that you would give. You know, our value here is generosity. I believe that. And I, and I believe that we as a church can be generous over the top today as we send Brian and Angie out, as we bless them in their ministry. So I'm going to give you a chance to, to just dig deep this morning to give. If you're not prepared to give, we have PayPal. Hear me this morning. You can go home today. Go to our website, nlccfamily.com. Check on PayPal, and you can give to bless Brian and Angie. Can we do that this morning as a church? Lisa and I have our gift. We're going we're to do that. We're going to ask that you partner along with us this morning. Ushers, if you would just make your way, if you would just help. And after we receive that offering this morning, we're going to pray specifically for Brian and Angie. So, dig deep. Let's just spend a moment worshiping, guys, with you to help us.
God, that your Holy Spirit would just soften their hearts, that you would begin to speak to them and to begin to just nudge them, Lord God, of the importance of this ministry that, that Brian and Angie want to bring to Lawrence. God, move on their hearts. I pray that students would be open, that they would be receptive, Lord God, that as they come bringing love and bringing hope, Lord Jesus, that you would just help their ministry to be fruitful, that you would help them in every way, God, that you would equip them. God, I thank you right now in advance for your favor. I thank you that your favor is not only with them now, but your favor is going before them. God, we know that you're making connections even now. You're bringing the right relationships into place even now. God, we know that you are orchestrating and moving even now behind the scenes, God. You are working and making all things work together for good. We thank you for that. So God, as a church, we just come together. We stand united around this family. God, we pray for your blessings to be upon them. We pray that you would empower them. God, we pray that you would just fill them with all wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And Heavenly Father, we pray that every need they have, you would be Jehovah Jireh, their provider, that you would supply their every need, Lord Jesus. And God, we thank you that we can send them out, that we can partner with them. God, we look forward to what you are going to do. And I just thank you, God, even now, for being greater than circumstances. Bless this family, Lord, in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody says, Amen. speaking to you, please stop by. Please sign up for a newsletter. Please inquire about how you can partner with them financially. We do as a church support them, but you heard the need. And God works through people. So I pray that you would be open to that this morning. Have you been encouraged? Have you been blessed? Have you rejoiced in God's greater today? Thank you. Let me pray over you real quickly. God, bless your people. We thank you, Lord God, that the church is in a building. We are the church. We're the temple of your Holy Spirit. And so as we leave today, God, we leave here assured that you're going with us. God, just continue to bless your people. Strengthen them. God, continue to move in their life, their situations, whatever it may be, God. Show yourself strong. Show yourself greater. God, we rejoice in you today that your word says we are the head and we are not the tail. We are above and we are not below. And we know that's true because of you. You're our firm foundation, Lord God. So, Lord, we thank you for being with us today, for being with us throughout this week, God. Just fill your people with joy, peace, and strength. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Shake a few hands. Give somebody a high five. Make sure you stop by the bishop's table on the way out. God bless.